What, what worries me, and one of the things I've been writing about, is that I don't think Canadians, uh, Allo, what you're saying, Kevin, is I don't think Canadians generally seem to understand that we're winning the lottery ticket right now. We're winning the lottery. You have this phenomenal boom, prosperity-driven boom in commodities, you know, which is unusual in the last, you know, whatever number of decades you want to pick. You know, we're looking at oil prices that uh, we had the Bank of America come out today, and they're looking at $160 oil. You know, uh, we can choose, you know, copper at $12. I mean, I have my own projections of what's going on. Um, we really have an opportunity here, and I'm worried that we're going to squander it. It's very much like all the research we read on someone who actually does win the lottery, and then you visit them four years later, and they're living in a trailer in Tennessee. And uh, whether they're from Alberta or not, they're still being put in Tennessee for some reason. <laughs> That's good. Because <laughs> they deserve it. But I, uh, I'm worried I, about us blowing that opportunity. Sure, it's, and it's a, it's a valid concern. I think uh, the challenge we've had in Canada is our productivity growth for our, our economy has been weak, and there's a bunch of reasons for that. I blame it on taxation. What I would like to see happen, I want to be a realist about this, is that if you think about just theoretically as a Canadian, if we could take corporate tax to zero, and hear me out on this, all the jobs that corporations create is where all the wealth is created. We want to be employed by companies. If we brought our corporate taxation rate to zero, we'd have a huge amount of capital coming from around the world to set up businesses mm -hmm. here. That's number one. What I'd like to do is get personal taxes in Canada down to 37% from 46, because they're too high. And the, re the way to get that done is to reduce the size of government and stop asking them for so much stuff because it's so inefficient to put capital through the government and have them provide services when the private sector would do a better job. And the area that I want to attack, and I almost sound like a politician now, is I want to privatize certain aspects of health care in this country mm -hmm. to add efficiency to it. We certainly could do that. And wealthy people are willing to pay for health services so they don't have to wait. Well, let them do that and then use these services to support poorer people that can't afford an MRI. So, we have to get off this thing that government is our friend. It's not our friend. It's a cost. And I, I want to reduce it in a big, big way. And I would love to see one of the politicians shake up this election by saying, you know what, here's my mandate. I'm going to shrink us. I'm going to start firing some of the people at work here. I would love that. We only have a few minutes left here, and I, and I want to get to you know, one of these broad questions and create your own parameters, but somebody says, I'll pick a number, we have a million dollars to invest, and I'm choosing between equities and bonds and precious metals and cash, um, you know, and, and with those equities or bonds, what kind of companies am I looking for? Obviously, dividend paying, um, but beyond that, what kind of advice would you give? Well, here's some advice that I've learned uh, just doing it myself and lessons I've learned both that have worked and, and have not worked. Um, so here's some basic premises if you're an investor. I don't care if you have $5,000 you're putting to work or $500 million. It doesn't matter. These same rules apply. First of all, look at your personal portfolio and ask yourself, does one stock or name, as they're called when you're servicing them, represent more than 5% of my net worth? If not, sell it down to 5%. Never own a stock that rep represents more than 5%. And, you know, I understand if you own a business and... I'm talking about when you're investing capital after you've sold <laughs> yeah. your business. 5% max. No sector, and we make this mistake in Canada all the time, more than 20%. In other words, no matter how much you love energy, how much you believe it's going to $160, no more than 20%. In commodities that have no yield, gold, for example, I hold that at a 5% weighting all the time. I sell it down when it's up or whatever. I don't fall in love with gold. I don't fall in love with commodities because they have no yield. And when they correct, they don't touch the sides on the way down and they break your heart very badly. Mm -hmm. It happens all the time. People forget when you get complacent. And above all, don't use leverage. Don't borrow money. Pay off your mortgage before you do anything. Don't have debt. Because the people that I've seen run into tragedy don't understand or respect debt. Debt can kill you. Mm -hmm. I don't use it. I don't like it, I buy it when other people issue it to me, but I don't have any. Mm -hmm. Debt is evil. You know, it's interesting, one of the things I think there's a naivety on the part of investors is they think that somebody else knows. You know, I, I mean, I, boy, I, 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 I get a thousand communications a month talking to me about investment stuff, and they think somebody else knows, and I think, you know, the Japanese earthquake is a great example of 
you think somebody saw that coming down the pike? Do you think we really saw North Africa blowing up, you know, starting in, in Tunisia, you know, then into Egypt? Those are examples. I mean, I just out of what you're saying, I think it's so important for people to hear. That's why you don't put more than 20% in one area. You may be dead sure, you know, you could have made, I mean, I've liked uranium as, a, as an investment for about five years, but boy, didn't that remind us why you don't get overboard on stuff? And I just think it's, it's a great point to make that the world's giving us tons of examples. You think somebody else knows? No, they didn't know about that stuff. I've seen it happen over and over and over again where people just fall in love with a story or an idea and they just get slaughtered. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, you, you have to have, it's the only free lunch in investing is diversification. And now, for Canadians, you need global diversification. You must invest in other places. That just reduces your risk. We've only got a couple of minutes here, so just to fire quickly at you, exchange traded funds. Are they in competition with the O'Leary funds where you have management? A lot of people say, I don't want to pay a management fee. I want to do it myself. And now with the whole exchange traded fund market, it gives you an opportunity in so many different areas. Oh, I love ETFs. The reason I don't use them though is there's no yield. I need, I don't care what the idea is. If I can't get a 6% cash yield annually, I don't do it. You can't get my money out of bed unless I get 6%. So there are no ETFs to provide you 6% in the equity markets because you're just buying indexes. And there's nothing wrong with that if you want low fees. To get 6%, you need to hire managers to go find companies that are issuing securities that are paying 7 and 8% that are growing, which is what I do. That's, that's all I do. Every single dollar I invest is sending me a check every month, and I go down at night and visit it, and I feel warm and fuzzy. I like to see the checks coming in every month. I've got expensive kids. I've got an expensive wife. I've got to pay for that stuff. But, but, but behind that is, is something else you're saying, and, and inherent in that statement is you're patient. You know, I mean, people oh, yeah. who look, who are impatient, doesn't matter if in their business, they're not paying their dues. You know, as you, uh, I, I think that's just a key component of being successful. You know, I, I want to get two themes out before we end, because we only got, as you see here, four minutes. I, I want to say something that actually was the genesis of this city. I was here when we won um, the hockey at the Olympics, and I realized for too long, I've been a Canadian for over 50 years, we're apologetic about success. Mm -hmm. Well, to hell with that. Mm -hmm. Like, why can't we be winners and take no prisoners? Mm -hmm. Why can't we say, come and compete with us and we'll kick your ass? Mm -hmm. I like that. I want to change our public attitude and say, look, we're winners, we focus on success, we're entrepreneurs, and we want to compete globally. That's my message. Let's not apologize anymore for winning. Let's make everybody understand that we're Canadians and we're winners. That's number one. And number two, I want to tell this story because it hit me like a ton of bricks. It only happened to me last week. You know, it's the second time this has occurred. It happened with my daughter first and now my son. I take him over to visit his dad in Switzerland a lot, or his grandfather, because he's getting older, and my, my parents are Swiss. And we always take the flight uh, that goes from Toronto, where my, my child's in school, all the way to Geneva. And every time, I take a seat in the front, first class, and he goes to the back of the bus. So this time, he says to me, Daddy, why is it that you get to sit up front all the time? And you get better food, and you get the movies, and I'm in the back. And I said to him, you have no money. <laughs> <laughs> and that, to me, says it all. Let's just finish with a couple of quick personal questions here. Um, top business book or book on success you'd recommend to someone to read? You know, I, I've always liked uh, Jack Welch's book, written a long time ago on what he did at GE, because he set performance metrics in place and he fired weak people that didn't deliver. I've always liked that message. I've been working on a book now for two years, and it's like giving birth. It's mm -hmm. really hard to do. It's going to come out this fall, and I really respect people who write these books, because I want to tell my story and pass on those you know, scripts of success that I hope other entrepreneurs will pick up on. The most important thing is, Tell your story, but not just your successes, your failures, so people don't do those again. Mm -hmm. Now, if I got your iPod uh, today, what would be on it? Because I know you're a music lover, yeah. and I thought you were setting yourself up because uh, Kevin does a nice uh, Jethro Tull, thick as a brick, and I thought, no, you don't want to be doing that song too often. So what would I find in your iPod? You know, I, I have really um, eclectic music tastes. I have 89,000 purchased songs on my massive server and real high resolution, not the you know, crap you download for free. This stuff I've been collecting for years and burning off my own CD collection and buying. And I, I listen to everything, but you know, when I take, an, I've got 
one iPod that I carry all the time. And lately, I've been getting back into the remastered Beatles and listening to how genius they were. But also, Steely Dan has really got me going again. I love that stuff. And, you know, even uh, I I was listening to The Who the other night, some of the early stuff. I've gone back to the old retro rock. And a lot of the stuff produced today is crap. It's never going to have the test of time. I was going to say, I needed you at my house last night. I'm serious. I was wearing a, a Steely Dan 1994 tour, and my daughter looked at me and just went, lame. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's something else you might not know about Kevin. He went to high school in the Pian, same high school as Avril Lavigne, speaking of music. And I want to know who's got the better brand. <laughs> well, I will, I will say that she did a great job in, in an industry that's impossible to make money in be by being unique and sticking with it and staying consistent in what she delivered. And I listened to her, her latest record just last week, and it's pretty good. And she's growing up, obviously. Um, I only do one thing. I'm an investor, and you know, I'm myopically focused. I have a very, very simple philosophy, and it's I want to go to bed richer than I woke up, and I like to work. I tried re- retirement. It's boring. I like money, and I'm proud to celebrate it. I love capitalism. I want children to understand that the only thing that matters in life is money. That's what I teach. Okay, last, last question, and it's a, it's a gimme. Who's going to win the Stanley Cup? You know, I'm going to tonight's... Think where you are. I'm going to tonight's game. I, I, listen, listen, I'm telling you this story. I, I like what I'm seeing here. I, you know, I made the assumption I got to town that I could just get some tickets and go to tonight's game. <laughs> I had to call the owner this afternoon to get tonight's game. And I'm going because I think there's a 50-50 chance Canucks are going to do it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, join me in thanking Kevin O'Leary. And as you you heard earlier, you can turn your TV on at any time of day, and he will be there doing a program. Kevin, thanks very much. A real pleasure. Thank you very much. I've really enjoyed it. Thanks.